Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Code Israel. Make sure to like and subscribe. And in order to watch future episodes, uh, subscribe to our channel on JNS TV on YouTube. Uh, I'm here today with Brigadier General and Reserves Amir Avivi. He's the founder and chairman of IDSF, uh, an organization of 30,000 generals, commanders, and officials in all branches of Israeli security. Um, so before we even get into what we wanted to talk about today, we had a lot of comments on our last episode about Judea and Samaria. So I wanted to ask you about some of the uh, challenges, I guess, we're facing with Judea and Samaria in this war. Well, as you know, in the last uh, two years, we have seen many terror attacks emanating from Palestinian cities in Judea and Samaria. Some of them, the attacks were in Judea and Samaria itself. Uh, some of the attacks in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem, in other uh, cities. Uh, the Iranians are investing huge amounts of money and uh, bringing uh, weapons through Jordan into uh, the Palestinian cities in Judea and Samaria. They are equipping, training uh, terrorists which uh, operate under Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, and groups of the Palestinian Authority, the Fatah, mm -hmm. the PLO. And uh, they are continuously inciting, continuously trying to carry out terror attacks. And this is a huge uh, challenge. A lot of people idea. say a lot of people say that you know Hamas isn't in Judea and Samaria. So what is the problem? What can you explain? Like what what exactly are we facing with terrorism in Judea and Samaria? So actually, the reason why there hasn't been elections for many 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 years uh, in the Palestinian Authority it's because they know 100 percent that if they go to elections, Hamas will win decisively. Big part of the Palestinian society in Judea and Samaria supports Hamas. In all the latest polls, 80% support the 7th of October, this massacre. Um, and um, so not only just about Hamas, it's also about other organizations. It's interesting to see that the idea of releases every day how many uh, terrorists were apprehended. Since the beginning of the war, we're talking about more than 4,150 terrorists. Wow. Only 1,700 are Hamas affiliated. Wow. So the vast majority are not even Hamas. So there are many, many terrorists uh, from all different uh, groups. And unfortunately, all of them incite and all of them encourage terrorism, uh, whether it's the Palestinian Authority, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hamas, and other organizations that have emerged and uh, are operating in the area. Okay, well, now that we have that covered, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about IDSF. You know, I hear a lot and, you know, working with the organization for a while, um, we talk a lot about the goals of the organization and how its goal is to ensure security in Israel for generations to come. Can you tell us a little bit about, about how the organization does that? Well, sure. You know, um, from the very beginning, we understood that we really need to concentrate on the biggest question of all. What is needed to secure Israel and the Jewish people for generations to come? And it's really surprising that although we were expelled from our land so many times, you know, by the by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, by um, the Romans, uh, by the by Muslims. the Greeks, mm -hmm. uh, the Greeks didn't expel us, but we fought them fiercely. <laughs> they tried, they tried, but <laughs> they didn't no, it succeed. Didn't, it didn't work. <laughs> no, but um, you know, we spent two thousand years in the diaspora. You know, persecuted, being thrown from one place to another, inquisition, pogroms, six million Jews, the Holocaust. Third of our people were exterminated in gas chambers. Miraculously, we managed to build a state. And even since then, endless amount of wars and operations. And there is one big question that needs to be answered. What is needed to secure Israel, Israel for generations to come? And nobody's asking this question seriously. The government, no government in Israel has ever addressed this question seriously. The army is not dealing with that because it's much bigger, it's a much bigger question than the IDF. Shimbet, Mossad, there is not one think tank that is devoted to answer this question. So we took upon ourselves, not only to answer this question, and we have an answer, and the answer might, within the generations, change, but for, for right now, now, looking you know, at the coming generations, I think we think we know what is needed to secure Israel for generations to come. And then the question is, how do you educate about that? How do you really shape hearts and minds and the narrative of the Israeli society, the Jewish people, diplomats, governments, 
about the security needs of Israel and um, said, okay, we really want to nationally shape hearts and minds. How do you do that? So basically, uh, we build a strategy. And the strategy is, is based on four pillars that complement each other and enable us to be effective and do what we do. The first pillar is the big decision we took at the beginning as generals. We're not going to be just an organization of high-ranking officers. High-ranking officers like to be in closed clubs, you know. <laughs> Said, no, no, this is not what we want to be. We want to be a grassroots movement. Mm -hmm. Big movement with students, with high school kids, with the um, pre-army program kids. Um, and with people who officers. Israel is just yeah, important to them. Citizens, yeah. So, you know, we started four years ago, seven, eight people. Four years later, 32,000 Israeli officers, commanders, mm -hmm. operators, but also general public and young kids. Out of the 32,000, I think it's around 7,000 officers. Wow. From them, like 500 high ranking. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the first decision. And the grass grassroots movement is growing very fast um, as time goes by. That's the first decision. The second decision was we need to really educate the young generation. They are the future. We need to go to the high schools, to the pre army programs. And now we are even building our own pre army program in Otef Aza, in, in the surroundings of Gaza, in uh, Moshev Tkuma. Uh, so, focusing on the young generation is a very big mission we took upon ourselves. And we, we really send hundreds of officers every week to high schools and pre army programs to educate the young generation. And while do, doing so, we encourage them to join the grassroots movement. This is how the pillars complement each other. Mm -hmm. Third thing we, we understood, and it has a lot to do with what we're doing here, is that in order to engage with the society, you really need to be dominant on media and social media. So today we're all over uh, national media in Israel. We also interview internationally a lot. Um, I saw you at the European Parliament. Media, and you are then yourself, you're managing our social <laughs> media. So you know how <laughs> active it is. Yes. And I think that one of the exciting things we did with you, Eden, is that we understood that we need to engage with the young generation, and therefore we're very, very uh, active on, on TikTok, on Instagram, uh, YouTube yeah. Shorts, so on, you know, really where the, the kids are. You Facebook, guys won't believe, Facebook by the way, by the way, you won't like believe me. how Amir takes TikTok seriously, everyone. He is one of the most amazing people I've met, you know, that take care uh, of social media the way that he yeah. does. It's it's really great to see that you take it seriously. Yeah. So, you know, in the States, TikTok is not popular at all <laughs> for good reasons. But what can we do? Israeli kids are in TikTok. Yeah. And if you are not present there, they get the wrong messaging. It's yeah. amazing to see how seriously you take it, though, to talk to them directly. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's great. You know, I have long drives from, you know, from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv to yeah. the north, the south. So this is always a good time to do TikTok or Instagram live. <laughs> and then you get thousands of youngsters <laughs> that are listening and asking questions. And they're very curious. They really want to know. They do. Yeah, they want to know. What's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So media and social media, it's a big deal. And indeed, today we reached a point where you know, I cannot walk in the street without people approaching, saying, ah, call a cavoy, but it's great what you're doing, guys. And thank you. And people, you know, even today, uh, a woman approached and said, you are our voice. You give people this hope. This is the voice of the people. This is the voice of reason. This is the voice that really brings values, Judaism, Zionism, victory, re resolution, everything that the Isra Israel and the Jewish people need. And th this gets people really excited. And, and the last thing, last but not least, um, we understood that we really, really need to engage with decision makers in Israel and internationally. So we build a very dominant uh, research department that produces very high quality papers. And we meet regularly with the government, with the prime minister, and minister of defense, uh, Knesset members, but also diplomats here in Israel. And also we send delegations to Washington and the European Union to our, all over the place. And from, really what I, from what I understand, also the research department helps pass laws in the government. Right, so we work with the Knesset uh, really to pass laws that are relevant in order to enhance the, the security. Uh, one of the last laws we passed uh, was the compensation to families uh, that lost uh, due, to, due to a terror attack uh, members 
and their ability to get compensation from the Palestinian Authority. It was impossible so far to do so. And now, very easily, they can get the uh, compensation. Wow. So this is something we dealt with for a long time uh, with some very great partners. Uh, usually we partner uh, in order to pass a law with other uh, individuals and organizations. And it, this was very successful. So, I mean, I see that IDSF, you know, does all this to help Israel, but it started with you. So I wanted to ask you, you know, a little bit about your background, your military background, all that. Go ahead. Okay. So, you know, we're situated in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And I come from a family that has been living in Jerusalem 15 generations. My family was expelled from Spain. They went through Saloniki in the beginning of the 17th century. My family arrived to Jerusalem. So all my family was born in Jerusalem, also me. But uh, the moment I was born, my father was already a young diplomat in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And as soon as I was born, we started moving around, you know, uh, being sent to different countries. So at a very young age, you know, I lived in Italy and then in Africa and Ivory Coast. So by the age of five, I spoke Italian, French, Hebrew. He came back to Israel for a short period of time and moved again to South America. Got to live five and a half years in South America and Chile and Argentina and learned in an American school. And really, I, as a youngster, I lived only three years in Israel. You know, uh, at the, between 13 to 16, my bar mitzvah, I did in Israel. And at the age of 16, my parents told me, okay, we move, we're moving again. And we went back to Rome. There I graduated from a British high school. And in 1987, August, came back to do my military service, joined the combat engineers and moved to the, from a British school straight to the first intifada. Wow. The biggest change I had in all my wow. you know, young life with all the um, changes and countries and Going cultures. from a British school to right. terrorist attacks in the middle of the exactly. street. So this was my first encounter with, really with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and everything that has been going, going here. And uh, I served for 30 years. I decided to pursue a military career. I really enjoyed leadership, commanding, commanding soldiers in the battlefield. Uh, I love military life. And uh, I did that for 30 years. And um, there were two things that really, really impacted me. One, I saw, you know, really the continuous decline of uh, Zionist uh, education, of patriotism, um, of really the ethos, you know, the education system has moved from really educating the young generation to be proud Israelis and know their history and why they are here. And this obviously impacts also afterwards the military service. And the other thing that impacted me was really devastating decision making that I saw for many, many years that really brought me to the understanding that we need to do something to really improve these uh, two issues. This is what motivated me later on to, to build IDSF, Israel's Defense and Security Forum. So I actually like it if we can go deeper into the, you know, things that you're talking about that you saw in decision making. Um, you know, I hear a lot of your lectures and we talk a lot about, you know, the decision, the disengagement plan. And uh, I'd like if you could tell a little bit about that experience yeah. for you. So I'll start maybe by telling you something about Zionism okay. and values and connection to our history and heritage because for soldiers, this is crucial. So it's all about spirit. You know, if you don't know what you're fighting for, it's a big problem to get people motivated and risking their lives. That's true. Especially when this is not, for most of the soldiers, it's not their career. It's not a professional soldier. This is the people of Israel that are being called to to give, and they are told to give, give up three or more years of their lives and endanger them. They need to understand why. Why is, it, why is that needed, you know? I can 100% agree with you on that because, you know, I was raised in America on Zionist values and, you know, Israel has always been important to me. And then I ended up coming to Israel because of Zionism, wanting to protect Israel because it's our homeland. 
and ended up joining the army and doing and giving up basically on my three years that I could have been in America to come to Israel and serve in the army. So it's true what you say, yeah, how no important. Combat. You served as a warrior. No, no, combat, no, yeah. Combat uh, soldier, right? Yeah, so it was super important, you know, and it's true what you say about the Zionist values that lead people in, to be able to do what we do and defend Israel. Yeah, so, you know, in uh, April 2002, following devastating attacks that went on from 2000 to 2002, the Second Intifada, after more than a thousand Israelis killed, the Israeli government said, okay, that's it. We're launching Operation Defensive Shields and taking over again all the cities in Judea and Samaria, the Palestinian cities. So April 2002, the operation starts. In April 2002, I get command 800 soldiers, a combat engineer battalion, battalion 605. And I find myself fighting, I think the fiercest fight I ever experienced in my military career. Day and night, day and night, falling terror attacks, uh, you know, in the area of Shechem, that they were on in Hebron and Ramallah. And you know, you know that even if you miss one terror attack, the terror attack will be devastating because it's suicide bombers. So it was really, really tough. And after 10 months, you know, the soldiers are really tired. And I get a chance to, to speak to all of them. And uh, before I speak with them, you know, the command tells us, um, okay, you have three weeks to organize. You are going to 10 months more. Think how hard it is. Wow. Three weeks and 10 months more of fighting. So I bring all my soldiers together and I speak to them. And while speaking to them, I find myself asking them a really strange question to ask as an Israeli soldier. How many of you have ever in your life been in Jerusalem? I found out that half of my battalion has never stepped foot in Jerusalem. These are Israeli soldiers. And then the, uh, the ones that were in Jerusalem, I asked them, how many of you have been in the Kotel, the Welling Wall? And half of them have never been. And I look at my battalion and I say to myself, oh, these are great kids. I have no clue what they're fighting for. And of course, it's hard for them. They don't connect. And that's three weeks, you know, one week vacation. You must give them one week to organize the equipment and only one week of training. To train a battalion like mine, it's, it's four months, one week. I said, you know what? We're not going to train. I'm taking my battalion to Jerusalem. I took the whole battalion for a whole week to Jerusalem. We went to David City, connected 3,000 years you know, back, and the, to the Kotel, the tunnels, the old city, the new uh, city. We went to the Knesset, and in the last day, 800 soldiers sat at the president's house and spoke with the president of Israel. And when this battalion went back to the battlefield, it was a completely different battalion, full of spirit and energy, and they really understood what they're fighting for, and they excelled to such an extent that uh, a few months later, I was called to the office of the chief of staff. He wanted to understand what's going on with his battalion, you know. So I come to his office. It was the uh, Moshe Bogi Elon. And I tell him, I tell him the story. I tell him, this is all about spirit, you know. And he, I think he was so impressed that following that, after two years of service as a battalion commander, I was appointed to be aide de camp of the chief of general staff and found myself moving from the tactical level to the national level, you know, wow. the chief of staff office, coordinating all the operations of the IDF and in coordination with the Mossad and the Shimbet, uh, all the intelligence in the office and international relations. And at that time, in, in Judea and Samaria, we were two years after Operation Defensive Shields, things started to stabilize, started. It took us a month and a half to regain control of the cities. It took us five years to stabilize the situation. Wow. This can give us a bit of understanding what's waiting for us in Gaza. Oh my God. Don't I don't even want to ring, think about it. Conquering is not the, 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 the complicated part. It's really cleaning the area. It's stabilizing. It takes a long time. Um, and um, so, but after two years, really things started to stabilize in Judea and Samaria, Gaza, complete loss of control. And I think that when people ask themselves, how can it be that we have such a monster in Gaza? If, you know, tens of thousands of, uh, of terrorists 
35,000 Luchman. How can it be? Well, there's a very good explanation. You know, Gaza between 67 all the way to the early 90s was a non-issue. Israelis used to shop in Gaza, used to go to the beach. There was no fence, no fortifications. Yes, there was first intifada in 87. Okay, they threw stones, but and then they were in the stone, stone age. Okay? Yeah. Literally. Compared to today. No, oh, yeah, it's a whole different thing. It was really the Stone Age. And, and in Gaza, there wasn't, there wasn't even a division. It was like a small headquarters, you know. Most of the forces were not in Gaza, were in the north, in Lebanon, then Samaria, Syria. Um, but then came Oslo. And in Oslo, we handed uh, the cities in Gaza and also Jericho to the Palestinian Authority that was based on a vicious terror organization, uh, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. We didn't leave the Egyptian border. We didn't take out our towns. We just handed them the cities with a decision not to operate them anymore. This was enough to take Gaza from the Stone Age, literally in 94, to complete chaos Ten years later, with rockets, mortars, anti-tank missiles, endless amount of attacks. When I arrived to the office of uh, the chief of staff, 2004, there were explosive tunnels. There were dozens and dozens of tunnels connecting Gaza to Egypt. There were rockets being shot to Sderot and other places. Anti-tank missiles shot at APCs. Two APCs exploded uh, with all the soldiers killed. Um, it was a mess. We had all brigades, armored brigades, they operating in big operations. And at that moment, uh, on one side, we won against terror in Judea and Samaria. We defeated terror, which is not easy to do. On the other hand, Gaza, complete loss of control. And in this reality, the obvious thing to do was, of course, to extend the operation in Gaza and get, get it over with, right? But what happened was that, uh, you know, one day the chief of staff and me were sitting in the, the headquarters. Secretary comes in and said, open the TV, you must see this. We opened the TV, we see Prime Minister Sharon standing in the Ritzelia Convention and saying, I decided to pull out of Gaza. And I look at the chief of staff, he looks at the TV, shocked. Like it was a decision was, that was completely disconnected from any reality in the midst of a fierce fighting. Well, I said, okay, bye, I'm going out, you know. <laughs> and this has nothing to do even with the uh, peace visions or plans. It was, it was simply, it was- Disconnected. Didn't make sense, it was yeah. completely disconnected from reality. So we brought our, the officers, we assessed, assessed the situation, and a week later there was a cabinet meeting. I was, you know, sitting on the side, all the ministers, prime minister, Chief of staff, all of them sitting around the table, and uh, Sharon, the prime minister, calls. I decided to disengage. What's your assessment? <laughs> and I'm sitting in the side. I'm thinking to myself, you know, in the army, we usually assess first, and then, then decide. <laughs> I mean, what do you mean? I decided what's the assessment? But the chief of staff says to him, Mr. Prime Minister, if you pull out of Gaza like that, in one year, Gaza is going to become Hamastan, El Kadastan, and Hezbollahstan. We're going to lose control. Prime Minister listens, doesn't say anything. He looks at the head of Shin Bet, Avi Difter, said, Avi, what's your assessment? Said exactly what the book is said. If you connect Gaza to Egypt, endless amount of weapons, money, technologies, operatives, you know, we will go in Gaza and out, and we're going to lose control of this place. And although this was the defense establishment assessment, decided to move forward with this plan. And um, following that, like two or three months later, he fired the chief of staff and brought somebody that uh, was more attached to the idea than Halutz. And then it was amazing for me to see, once you change the chief of staff, how fast the whole organization aligns. Suddenly I hear the IDF saying, it's not going to be Hamastan, it's going to be Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> Peace will descend from heaven into the Gaza Strip. And I'm saying, but three months before we said it's going to be Hamastan, nothing changed. How can people say that? You know, and understood that, you know, they're aligning with the new 
chief of staff. And at the same time, I was hearing all these uh, former generals interviewing on radio and TV, signing petitions, and all of them saying, it's going to be Singapore, Singapore. And, you know, I saw the 7th of October 20 years ago. I knew exactly what's coming. It was obvious. You wrote about it in your book, and We I Will wrote, Never uh, Go Back. Right, and, 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 and I wrote, and the book was published before the, the war thing. Everyone's right? amazed by, by the fact that you wrote down that this is something yeah. that, you know, we're facing. And, and what I wrote, you know, it's not just me. It's, it's based on the assessment that IDSF wrote two years ago to the government and the uh, security establishment saying war is imminent. We're on our way to war, and it's going to be devastating if, if we're not proactive in we attack first. You say something about the difference between the wars, that it could have been either... So, yeah, so two years ago we said, look, to the government and the army, you have only two choices. It's either going to be six-day war scenario or Yom Kippur war scenario. Or we are proactive and we attack first, or they will attack us and it's going to be a complete surprise. We won't have the intelligence to know prior to the attack that it's happening. And unfortunately, Israel chose Yom Kippur scenario. And it's devastating because everything that happened to us in the last 30 years, thousands and thousands of Israelis that were killed and hurt, all of it are decision making. Yes, our enemies always want to kill us, but we constantly give them the tools and the ability to do so. And, and I, we wrote, you know, it was now 30 years to Oslo, we wrote, I, very big uh, paper we did. We did also a convention. a convention talking about 30 years of follies. Really unbelievable. One of the things that already when I was in the army I was shocked is was there that, you know, when we went to Oslo, and there could be a whole discussion, should we have gone or not? Okay, but we did it, and we knew we were signing an agreement with a terror organization, so we said, let's... Um, Manage risk. You know, risk management today is a big deal. Everybody manages risks or organizations. The way Israel managed risks is they said, okay, we're not going to give them everything instantly. We're not going to remove Jewish towns. We're not going to give up control of the Egyptian border. We're just going to pull out of the cities. We're going to give them weapons to control the cities in Gaza. In Gaza, in, in Judah and Samurai, it was all, all, on, only Jericho. Let's see that this works. If this works, Okay, that means business, and you know we can move forward. I can tell you that two years after signing uh, this agreement and after handing them the cities, it was crystal clear that it failed completely, completely, hundred percent, hundred percent failure. And the obvious thing to do was, okay, you know, it didn't work. Let's stop. Maybe let's go back. also reverse the situation, but at least stop. You know. And at that time, you know, Israel looks at the reality and said, no, yeah, complete failure. What should we do? We're the startup nation. We have an amazing idea. Let's pull out of Judea and Samaria also. <laughs> and we pull out of the cities in Judea and Samaria. And guess what? Exactly the same result. They build huge terror infrastructure. And this is what brings us to the year 2000, to this devastating attack with more than 1,000 people killed. And so many people hurt. It's us. And you know, in you your know, at a certain point, I felt that's it. I'm fed up with seeing people killed for nothing. I want common sense. I want professionalism. I want values. And we want to make sure that we are able to really make sure that the Zionistic Zionist project stays on rail. You know that it doesn't derail. Yeah. And this is what IDSF does. We really educate the young generation, the public and decision makers. And we are powerful enough that politicians know today that if they will take a decision that it's against uh, the security of Israel, we are able to fight it fiercely and really make an impact on, on, on the public and make them understand what's right and what's wrong. That's true. This was absent before. And, uh, you know, I actually wanted to ask you, I've heard your lecture many times, and I would love it if you could tell viewers um, kind of the question that you ask people about the difference between Judea and, Judea and Samaria and Gaza, uh, and, you know, why you ask that question. <laughs> well, you know, many people ask, 
why there was no intelligence? How can it be that 3,000, 4,000 Nufba terrorists, which probably sometimes in the middle of the night uh, understood that they are going to war, how can it be that not even one of them pick up the phone, phoned the Shin Bet and said, in two hours, in four hours, there is war? You know how much difference it would have made, even two hours knowing that there is war? I'm not talking about 48 hours, which the intelligence is supposed to give to Israel at least that there is going to be war, but two hours. And this really goes into understanding the different models, theoretic models, which we tried all of them, uh, of existence or nothing non existence in the land of Israel. And um, what one of the models is disengaging. They are on one side of the fence, we are on the other side of the fence. We hear a lot of politicians saying we need to separate, we need to separate from them physically. They need to be on one side of the fence, we need to be on the other side of the fence. This is what we did in Gaza. How did it work for us? Didn't work at all. <laughs> Devastating, right? Um, so basically what we created in Gaza, the reality we created, unlike what's happening in Judea and Samaria, you know, in Judea and Samaria, we, we have freedom of operation. We, we operate everywhere, every night. Every time we have specific intelligence about terror activities, we are able to go in a Palestinian city, apprehend the terrorists, and prevent the terror attack. We're not operating all the time inside the cities. We, do, we go in just when we have specific intelligence. Mm -hmm. We're not operating, uh, we're not policing them, yeah. okay? But if there is terror infrastructure, we go and we deal with this. So in Judea and Samaria, let's say we apprehend every night, let's say 15 suspects, terrorists, every night, on average, maybe more, maybe a bit less, but on average. Well, you know, if we do 15 times 365 a year, right, times, let's say, 17 years of uh, Hamas, it's roughly 94,000 people. I imagine how much intelligence you get from 94,000 people and the ability to recruit people, to understand what's going on, to get intelligence and so on. So 17 years, you done somewhere, let's say 94,000 people, 17 years at the same time in Gaza, how many we apprehended? Zero. Zero, not even one, because you cannot cross the border. Because they are equipped with tens of thousands of rockets and IEDs and capabilities, and there are whole battalions and companies. Crossing the border is war. You know, it's so important that you're saying this now, because after hearing you say this in lectures, I actually went and said it in debates with pro-Palestinians. And I said to them, do you guys even know, like you're saying that we commit all of these arrests, so we do all these arrests in Gaza. Do you guys know in the last year how many arrests? Because you asked that question and even here people are like, oh yeah, all the time. But I asked them and they're like, yeah, there are hundreds of arrests. I'm just like, no, there's not even one arrest in Gaza because the second we cross that border, it's war. We're not allowed to just go in there because we disengaged from there. Right. So, so obviously, if, if you are not operating in the area, you don't have human intelligence. You have no ability to stop what's growing. Yeah. That's another issue, that if you are not operating inside, obviously you cannot stop the buildup of uh, power. Now, there was this preconception saying, ah, well, what's the problem? We have Air Force intelligence, we can attack them from there. But, you know, they, they know how to overcome this. They build these deep tunnels. A city no underground. Air Force base can reach it. They put all the infrastructure in hospitals, in uh, UN sites, in kindergartens. You cannot bombard a hospital or a UN site or a kindergarten, you know, from the air. Yes, you can on the ground when you go in, you can reach these places and, and go in and deal with them, but you cannot do it with the Air Force. So they basically build themselves, in, build themselves in a way that everything is embedded in civilian areas. It makes the Air Force completely irrelevant. And the intelligence, you don't arrest anybody, so you don't have intelligence. And they know that we have technological capabilities, so they don't use phones or computers 
uh, but they try to avoid technology. We're basically blind. Yeah, and then you're blind, you don't, and you don't see anything, and they are building themselves endlessly, and by the time you fight them, as we are doing now, it's a monster. I, I want you to understand, Eden, the size of Hamas is the size of all of ISIS. And ISIS, the whole U.S. and the uh, Russians and Iran and the international coalition dealt for years with ISIS, attacking them fiercely. There were around 35, 40,000 operatives. This is Hamas. But Hamas is more equipped, more trained, with better technologies and much better infrastructure with all these tunnels. And they're right on our border. And, 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 and when people ask, how can it be? Eight months, nine months. Yes, it can be, because they are the size of ISIS. And it's a very, very tough war that we need to, to deal with. And we brought it on ourselves. We gave them control. We did every mistake possible. We enabled the creation of Hamas, and Hamas took takeover. We knew it was coming. And we have to learn the lessons and make sure that this time, the goals the government set for the war are met 100%. This means completely destroying Hamas as a governmental and military entity, bringing back all the hostages, all of them, and making sure that we set the terms that never again there will be a terror army in the Gaza Strip. And in order to do that, we need to control the Egyptian border. We cannot have this buildup of power again with endless amount of weapons and know-how and operatives going from the Sinai Peninsula into Gaza. We need full freedom of operations, just as we have in Judea and Samaria, for all the reasons I mentioned before. It will take years to degrade their capabilities to really a level that is, you know, is really small. And we need to distance them from our borders. We need a perimeter, but this is more tactical, not uh, strategic, mm -hmm. but it's important. And we need to make sure that it's not Hamas or Jihad or even the Palestinian Authority, which is as terrible as, all, as the others. People don't know that they maybe don't, Palestinian Authority is responsible for pay for slay. Yeah, they are, they are funding terror billions. They are paying billions for terrorists. They are inciting in schools. And they were they supposed to be our peace terrorists. partner. Yeah, and, and there are no peace partners. They are enemies. And we need to get rid of all of them. And the only viable solution is really dealing with the local leadership. It's the clans in the cities. All of them are run by local clans. I can tell you that in Operation Defensive Shield, two years, the Palestinian Authority didn't function. We continued working with the clans, with the municipalities in Judah and Samaria and all the cities and worked perfectly well. Why we reinstated them, God knows why. I don't know. But we need to build local leadership. Uh, first do it in Gaza. And once we see it working, I, I will do the same also in, in Judah and Samaria. This is just one example of kind of solution also for the long term. And there are many solutions that don't undermine Israel's security and give a solution also to the Palestinian society. I see. Um, you know, I actually wanted to go back to what we were talking about, Hamas embedding themselves in uh, civilian infrastructure. And I also, you know, I served uh, in the Jordan Valley. I was on the lines of Jordan Brigade. Uh, and I did a couple, I did a lot actually of arrests in that area. And I just wanted to tell you, like, there was this one time where I ended up going uh, uh, to an arrest with the uh, head of operations of the Jordan Valley. I was his right hand woman, I guess you could say not right hand man, but I was with him, his chapak, in other words. Right. Uh, and so I went into an arrest and, you know, this is a story I tell a lot when I speak in front of people or I talk to friends. You know, we go to, uh, to an arrest because we had intelligence that somebody in the house was going to commit a terrorist attack. He posted it. He posted it on Facebook, OK, that he wanted to commit a terrorist attack, just so you understand. And so we go to the house and we, you know, get to the door. We knock on the door. We start knocking, asking them to let us in, asking them <laughs> in the middle of the night. And as soon as the door opens, the first thing I saw in front of me was a three year old kid crying and screaming. And I'm just looking at him with like all the weapons on me. And I don't know how to react. I felt like, you know, the worst person in the world. But my commander back then, he was really strong. He, he knew these things. He, he dealt with it a lot. And he just kind of yanked me. He pulled me over and he was like, let's go. Let's go. We have a job to do. 
So we started searching the house and we ended up finding extreme numbers of bombs, weapons, knives. We ended up finding all of these materials, in other words, being used for this terrorist attack that he wanted to commit. And then I realized how their mindset and how their um, how themselves in, embedded in civilian in infrastructure works. We're talking about their own children. We're talking about the fact that we're not to blame here because their children are in these homes and they try to kill our children, in other words. We have to go in and we have to do what we have to do. And people think that this is only happening in Gaza. Well, it's not happening only in Gaza. It's happening in Judea and Samaria. It's happening here. It's happening in the Jordan Valley in Israel. And, uh, you know, this is something that is, you know, something that we need to learn how to fight. And I don't think any army in the world knows how to do it better than the IDF does. Try to, you know, be as moral, I guess you can say, as possible while, you know, fighting against one of the most vicious and awful terrorist groups in the world. And I wanted to ask you about that in regards to that. How do you think, you know, in Gaza right now, uh, our army being faced with all these awful moral dilemmas, how do you think that they're doing and what do you think that their challenges are? Well, as you said, there is no army that is more moral than the idea. What they are able to do, I don't see any army being able to do so. And unfortunately, you know, there is a part of anti-Semitism is double standards. And even here, you know, there are double standards and demands from Israel that no other army is demanded to do. And it makes it difficult and challenging. But I think that looking at the numbers, even if I stick to the numbers of Hamas and the IDF, Hamas are complete liars and cannot trust their numbers. But even if I take the numbers they are saying, and I take the numbers the IDF uh, estimates how many terrorists they killed, the ratio is one to one. Between Unheard of. Terrorists killed and, you know, and citizens. And, you know, you go into the UN inside, they will, they will say a normal ratio in this kind of warfare would be one to ten. One to five is amazing. One to one is unheard of. Unheard of. Okay. And uh, in this sense, I think that you, taking in account that every, almost every single house inside Gaza is a terror hub. All of them, it's civilian houses, they're all full of weapons and uh, capabilities. All the houses are connected to tunnels. Uh, all the terrorists are in uh, UN sites and hospitals. They don't have any rules. N no rules, no uniform. Uh, it's a challenge, you know, to differ between a terrorist and a citizen. Um, and, uh, you know, you hear so stories from soldiers like a, a guy uh, on a wheelchair uh, moving in the street and suddenly stands up and uh, shoots an RPG, things like that, you know. They, they are, they, the soldiers are dealing with really crazy situations. And um, I think overall they're dealing with this really, really well. And, you know, there's a story with the young kid. He reminded me one of the events I had as a battalion commander. We had, we had intelligence that... Um, terrorists are trying to move a suicide belt from Shechem into Israel in order to carry out a terror attack. So we, we started really checking thoroughly every single car that was moving through the check post. And I came because it was, a, you know, a, we understood that there is a very accurate intelligence. I came to the check post to see how the soldier, soldiers are dealing with this. And then you see a van arriving, big van, and there is a young guy driving the van and like a 90-year-old guy sitting beside him, and the 90-year-old guy is, is completely blind. Wow. And uh, the, the soldier approaches him, and he says to the young guy, get out. He says, please, it's my grandfather, you know, he's blind, I need to take him to the hospital, please, please. But you know, we're under intelligence, so the soldier said, get out. He gets out, he said, open the back of the truck. We, we open the back and it's all empty. There is only one can of paint in the middle. Paint. He says, you see, nothing. And dust, I have a can of paint. He said, open the can. And when he tells him to open the can, the guy starts sweating and getting nervous. nervous. And the soldier sees that it's happening and, you know, would say the gun, you know, aims at him, 
and says, okay, now open the can. And this uh, suicide belt was inside the paint. paint. In, in the paint? In, inside, inside, you know, like clothes in How did they in think to, 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 to reach in the paint? And no, take because it, it was in the nylon bag, yeah. you know, clothes really well. And they put it inside the, wow. the paint. And yeah, now if you just, you know, um, I, as you know, as you reacted when you saw us as a kid, if you just say, oh yeah, you know, poor guy, 19 years old. And, no, this is what they're doing. You know, they're using uh, the society and the Hamas is even worse because they are using them as human shields. Really, the, the interest of Hamas is to see as many Civilian. citizens killed as possible. They're trying to do everything within their hands to, to get them killed. Because it works. Yeah. With the international... This is what will create international pressure. And so this is the kind of monsters we're dealing with, and this is exactly why we need to destroy them completely. I agree with you on that. Uh, and I wanted to actually look at more of the October 7th now situation, okay? Um, I wanted to ask you, what does Israel need to do in order to ensure uh, the military goals of this war actually end up happening? Like the release of the hostages, uh, dismantling Hamas, how can we, how now in this war can we make sure that that actually ends up happening. Yeah, so, you know, we see a discussion in Israeli society saying, okay, there are two clear goals, destroying Hamas and bringing back the hostages. And some claim you cannot do both. I mean, you have to prioritize uh, releasing the hostages. Um, my view is that these two goals are completely connected and dependent on each other. Because Hamas strategy is not to release hostages. The reason why for months and months and months they're not releasing hostages is because this is the strategy. They want to keep them because what Hamas is, is, understands is they, can on, they cannot win on the battlefield. Okay, they stand no chance. The IDF is destroying them in every encounter. So they say, okay, we need to survive. How we'll survive? One, it's what we said before international pressure due to the amount of citizens killed and the pictures and everything that's going on. And they believe that if they manage to take Israel into elections because of internal turmoil, you know, like we saw in the last year before the 7th of October, then the war will stop. So they're holding the hostages and they want to see, you know, the society writing and demonstrating and, and so on. So the, and the more it happens, the less they have motivation to release uh, hostages. So how do we change this reality? The only way to do it is military pressure. What made Hamas release half of the hostages at the beginning of the war was a huge, huge maneuver of the IDF, huge military pressure, which got them really nervous. They felt they are collapsing. They begged for a ceasefire. And they were willing to give more than 100 hostages that to get two weeks of ceasefire. So if we want to really get them to be in a place where they are desperate for a ceasefire, it can happen only with huge military pressure. And we have to push harder, and we have to try to find the leadership and, and, and really close on them. And when they will feel an existential threat, then the motivation to reach a deal will be much higher. Now, and if they don't want to reach it, they would have to do it militarily. And I think that also, if the IDF will take control civil, from the, of the civil side, of the distribution of humanitarian aid, this will give us intelligence from the society. We need the Palestinian society to realize Hamas is not controlling them anymore. They are now under Israel. This will bring people to, to help us understand where the hostages are, to maybe even uh, give us uh, intelligence about the whereabouts of the leadership of Hamas. So it's only moving forward and being strong that will really enable us at the end of the day to win. And winning in Gaza is crucial, it's existential. It's not because Hamas is an existential threat. It's because winning in Gaza is what will send a message to all our enemies. I was actually don't, about to don't ask Don't mess you. with us. Because if you will, we will destroy you completely. And if we don't win, this is going to be devastating. We're in big trouble if yeah. we don't. 
And uh, I was actually going to ask you, you know, what the international community is missing here. Because, you know, we talk about Hamas, we talk about Hezbollah, we talk about PLO, we talk about terrorist organizations, but we don't talk about the head, the, you know, the head of the snake here, which, you know, is Iran. Of course. And I wanted to ask you, you know, what international communities are really missing about how Iran is working? I think that from day one, it was obvious we're not talking about a local war. This is a global war. We have a Chinese, Russian, Iranian front that has emerged, and it's a global threat. And they are, you know, operating in Europe, in Africa, in North Africa, in the Middle East. Um, and the, the world, if they want stability and not a third world war, the world needs to be, build an alliance that will counter this. And that Western Israeli Sunni alliance that would extend from the West through Israel to the Sunni world all the way to Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, Oman. We need an alliance that will stand strong against those who want to really change the globe. Yeah. And if we don't do so, Russia will become more aggressive in Europe. China will invade Taiwan. The Iranians will continue their... Uh, attacks all over the Middle East and beyond, because they're trying to, to really control all uh, international trade. They want to control, control the main strains for Mos, Bab el and even Gibraltar. They're trying to undermine Morocco. It's far away, but they want to control everything. For this, we need American leadership. And understanding that we're fighting a global fight, it's not a local issue. Yeah. And then Talking about, you know, America, actually, what effects do you think that anti-Semitism has on this war, if any? Do you think that, you know, worldwide anti-Semitism is helping, you know, our enemies in any way? We've seen the rise of anti-Semitism before the war. It's been rising and rising in the last, uh, you know, decade. And um, after the 7th of October, it has grown exponentially. And the Jewish world is in danger. And this uh, requires several things. One, require Israel to really make sure that Israel is a safe place for Jews. We need to safeguard our country. And because at the end of the day, I think that in the long term, we'll see hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Jews, making Aliyah. Hopefully, uh, amen. <laughs> yeah, I think that... Um, hard for me to see a future for the Jewish people in Europe. Things, and unfortunately, in the U.S., things are getting worse and worse. But one responsibility is making sure that Israel is safe and also gives Jews the, all they need to make an easy aliyah. So that's not easy to make aliyah. Israel is not making life easy for Jews who make aliyah, and we should because this is strategic. We need as many Jews in Israel. At the same time, Israel has to be very, very proactive in defending the Jewish, the Jewish communities and interacting with the different uh, states. And assisting Israel is doing it in many ways, but we can do more. Now, we have been trying to fight anti-Semitism for years. Huge amounts of money have been poured into the fight against anti-Semitism, and it's not working at all. Complete failure. And I think we need to reassess the way we're dealing with this, with, with anti-Semitism. I wrote about it in my book. You know, I think it's the only national security book that whole chapters are about the deleg de de legitimation and, and anti-Semitism and so on. Because when I talk national security, we, when we in IDSF talk national security, we're not looking just at Israel, we're looking at the Jewish people. And we build a state for the Jewish people. So it's not just about the state of Israel, it's about the whole Jewish world. And um, if I have to invest, I have one dollar, and I have to find anti-Semitism, and I have to ask myself, where do I put this dollar? What do I do? The first dollar needs to go to educating and empowering the Jews. The main issue we have is ourselves. We need to wake up and remember who we are. We are the heroes of our own story. We are the Jewish people, the chosen people, the people who 
really brought light to, to this world. We have to be proud, excited about who we are. I think that many Jews, you know, are uh, disregarding the heritage, the history, hiding their identity instead of, you know, trying it. And in my book, I, you know, I, I tell the story that uh, when I arrived to, at the age of 16 to a British school, a British school is, you know, it's like Harry Potter. It has right. houses, which compete. Like between, Gryffindor. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. like Gryffindor. Uh -huh. But instead of one game, like Swedish, in my school, the houses competed in every imaginary uh, sports, I mean, they, all of it. I mean, all year long we had, you know, uh, competitions between the houses. And also there was, um, like, the eldest in the house, they worked with the young kids in the house. It was a whole thing. So, you know, I arrived at the age of 16, and at the age of 17, I was deputy house captain. And in my last year in school, I was house captain. It's and it's pretty deal. unusual for an Israeli and a Jew to be house captain in a British school, okay? Um, and at the time, you know, I was a kid, so I didn't really think about it too much. But late, years later, I thought about it a lot. You know, how can it be an Israeli, a Jew, new in school? There were many kids that studied in the school from grade one. One on one, I was one of the newest people. And yet, you know, I became house captain. So I could, you know, I could have said, okay, it's because of my natural leadership or because I excelled in sports, which obviously these two things helped. But really there was something else. And this something else was that I was a very, very proud, proud Jew and Zionist. And it reflected everywhere. And it's not that I didn't have discussions, I did. But I learned a huge lesson. When you respect yourself and who you are, people respect you. If you disrespect yourself and who you are, people will disrespect you. I never experienced it. I, I lived all my life, young life outside of Israel almost, in international schools. I've never experienced anti-Semitism. People respected me. And this is something that every single Jew needs to learn. I Want guess. respect, respect yourself. I Stand strong, know who you are, know your history. Um, and you know, I see it also with Israeli kids. Um, in Israel, when you grow in Israel, you, you are stronger, you know, it's mm -hmm. in the country. But still, when you talk to the young generation, they don't know their history. They don't know, you know, they don't understand their heritage. You'd mistake. Yeah. I can't agree with you more because growing up in America, I definitely have seen anti-Semitism. I think that, you know, growing up in a public school, I was, you know, with many different religions and cultures together in the same school. And every time there would be something going on in Israel, you'd see people with Palestinian flags and you'd see people, you know, start being more bully, like bullying, uh, I guess, the Israeli or the Jewish students at the school. And it was something that, you know, we experienced. And I think that being proud and being a proud Israeli is something that definitely helped me get through those moments. And, um, you know, just to finish up, I wanted to actually ask you, you know, knowing you and being at your lectures and, you know, having many conversations with you as well, you have this way of giving people a more optimistic view and you really strengthen a lot of the Israeli society. People feel very empowered after listening to you speak. So I was wondering if you can give just a little piece of that to our viewers as well. Of course. Um, you know, when, um, when we, two years ago, and we gave our national security assessment, we said war, war is imminent. We're going to war. Um, we're thinking, what picture should we put on the cover? And we put a frog being boiled in, 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 a, in a can. And we said, this is Israel. Israel, you know, if things continue the way they are, meaning if we let Iran continue to move towards their nuclear capabilities and build other proxies, if we continue to see what's going on inside Israel, the takeover of the land in the Negev, in the Galil, uh, no personal security, all these things, um, we'll be in very big trouble in the coming decade or two. And on the 7th of October, it was a terrible tragedy. We'll never forget it. But also something has happened. The frog jumped out of the water, of the boiling water. And now we have a moment where we can really, really take care 
of all the major threats we have and win decisively in a way that we can really ensure the security and prosperity of Israel and the Jewish people for generations. And I'm a big believer that the bigger the win will be, the more decisive it will be on all fronts, even if it's a long war. The bigger the win will be, the greater the golden age of Israel and the Jewish people will be the day after. The day after we'll see peace agreements, the economy will bloom, we'll see massive aliyah, we'll see baby boom, like after any war, you know. So we have an amazing future ahead of us, but to really, really get to this point, we need to stay united. We need to stay focused on one thing and one thing only, winning decisively. And winning decisively is also bringing back all our hostages. It's also destroying Hamas. It's also being able to bring our citizens back to the north with no threat in South Lebanon. And with Hezbollah hit hard. It's also setting the terms for us, our ability to deal with Iran, which I hope will won't be just an Israeli issue, but really a coalition, a global issue. Iran is a global threat. So if we do the right things, there is going to be a difficult time in the coming year, maybe a bit more, but later on, there will be a great future. You know, I remember when I was a deputy division commander in the Gaza Strip, and I had all these delegations coming from the U.S., you know, senators, congressmen, rich communities, and so on, and we used to stand in Black Arrow, it's a you know, famous site overlooking Gaza. And they used to ask me, I was a colonel at the time, Colonel, what's going on in Gaza? I used to say to them, you know, basically, from the day of the judges, the Bible, same thing, you know. <laughs> Gazans attack us. We bring the people, we fight back. And you know, again and again, like the same, same thing. Nothing changed from the times of the Bible. You know, yeah. all all the stories in the Bible revolve around wars in Gaza. But I tell them, you know, after many wars in Gaza, in in the that time, at the end of the book of Judges, it says, and the land was quiet for forty years. So my rabbis asked, why I say that? I mean, every sentence in the Bible has a deep meaning. And the answer was that 40 years of quiet in the land of Israel is an event of biblical dimension. Never happened in 4,000 years. Wow. So it's up to us now to do the same. You know, we are in biblical times now. And now it's our time to make sure that after this war we have 40 years of quiet. It's up to us. And this is the good news. It's really up to us. We need to do what we need to do to secure uh, Israel. It just depends on our decision. It's us. It's all, and this is the good news. If we do the right things, we'll ensure our security and prosperity for generations. Yes, we will. Well, I just want to thank you so much for being with us, Brigadier General in Reserves, Amir Avivi. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much, Edna. And thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to follow JNS.org on Instagram and IDSF Israel as well. And to subscribe to JNS TV in order to get notifications of upcoming episodes. Uh, and yeah, so thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you next time.